Hello, everyone. This is Historian Splaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. So, I want to discuss for the 10th installment in my series on the history of the United States and 100 objects. I'm going to talk about an object called the Peregrine White Cradle, or simply the White Cradle. And this one will be for patrons only for one year. So if you are a patron and you've heard some of my recent lectures and my recent discussion with Michael J. Simpson about the early beginnings of New England, you know that I am just getting now into talking about colonial America, which actually happens to be my field, broadly speaking, right? early American history. And this particular object carries tremendous symbolic significance because of its alleged connection to Plymouth, an early English colony in North America that has sort of been retroactively adopted as the symbolic founding of America and American society. But before we get into that, what is this object itself? Well, it's a long, round, wicker cradle made mainly from willow shoots, put onto an oak and maple wood frame. It was created most likely in the Netherlands. The hooded design with the back hood is characteristic of the Dutch style, and it basically matches the forms of cradles seen in Dutch art of the 17th century, including paintings by Vermeer. It was allegedly brought over on the Mayflower itself in 1620 in anticipation of a coming birth, but it is also possible that it could have been imported to the Plymouth Colony somewhat later, and it is today held by the Pilgrim Hall Museum in Plymouth, Massachusetts. So this cradle, according to the family that eventually donated the object to the Pilgrim Hall was used to hold a baby named Peregrine White, who was himself born on the Mayflower when it was docked in America. And you may notice that name Peregrine actually means pilgrim, right? So it was a very intentionally symbolic name. Peregrine White's parents were William and Susanna White, who were two members of the separatist religious community in exile in the Netherlands, who boarded the Mayflower in September 1620 when it embarked from Plymouth, England, and who took with them their son named Resolved. And if you look back into colonial and early modern English records, you'll often see people with these odd names often sort of plucked from sentences in the Bible, like resolved or increase or preserved. You know, my favorite one personally is a New England colonist who is named Preserved Fish. So William and Susanna White, with their young son Resolved, boarded the Mayflower, and at that time, Susanna was already pregnant. And according to later chronicles, they brought this cradle with them. According to a report called Mort's Relation, which most likely was written by the pilgrim Edward Winslow in 1622, Susanna White gave birth to this boy, whom they named Peregrine, in November 1620, at which point the Mayflower had reached the shores of North America and was docked at Provincetown Harbor. So they had not yet landed at the legendary Plymouth Rock, but they were instead sojourning for several weeks by Cape Cod before they found a permanent place of settlement. This makes Peregrine White the first pilgrim child born in the New World, if you want to put it that way. He was not the first English child born in America. That title apparently goes to Virginia Dare, who was born in the temporary short-lived Roanoke colony further south in 1587, before it was abandoned. Nor was he the only child born on the Mayflower, Rather, on the way across the ocean, another child named Oceanus Hopkins 
was born during the crossing and also given, as you can tell, this very symbolic name after the ancient Greek sea god Oceanus. But still, Peregrine White was given the sort of honorary title of first pilgrim born in America. So shortly after, the family settled with other pilgrims at Plymouth on a small cleared out spot that used to be the site of a Native American village that was decimated and then abandoned because of disease epidemics. The pilgrims themselves also went through a very harsh first winter with starvation, exposure, and deaths from disease. That first winter was so severe and so weakened the small colony that reportedly they would take ill and dying men and prop them up in the woods with guns around the village in order to try to give the neighboring Native American nations the impression that they were still strong and could defend themselves. So it was a time of suffering and weakness and fear. And during that first winter, William White died. Shortly thereafter, Peregrine's mother, Susanna White, remarried to Edward Winslow, that other leading prominent pilgrim that I already mentioned. And this was the first English marriage to be made in America. Edward Winslow was one of the leading men of the company, and he apparently spearheaded the founding of another pilgrim village north of Plymouth, at another Native American habitation site, which apparently for a time was called Wrexham, but then shortly after was renamed Marshfield, after the extensive salt marshes all around it along the coast. And the town of Marshfield is still there, basically between Plymouth and Boston. And Marshfield became incorporated formally as a town in 1632. So as of 1636, Peregrine was living in a blended family with six children, and the entire family relocated to Marshfield in 1636 when Peregrine was 15 years old. And if we credit the family stories, which connect this cradle to the birth and infancy of Peregrine White, then that implies that the cradle traveled with the family, up to Marshfield and presumably was used for more babies that were born thereafter. When Peregrine came of age in Marshfield, he soon became a farmer with significant land holdings, a militia officer, and a representative of Marshfield in the general court of the colony. In 1648, he married a young woman named Sarah Bassett, who had been born in Plymouth, and whose parents were also members of the Leiden group, the small separatist Protestant group that had left England and temporarily lived in Leiden in the Netherlands. Peregrine and Sarah had seven children, and he became a fairly prominent and somewhat notorious member of Marshfield society. He was prominent and prosperous, He planted many European fruit trees around Marshfield, some of which survived for centuries after. And he was known for his devotion to his mother, and he was seen riding every day through Marshfield to visit his mother's house, wearing an impressive coat with large, shiny silver buttons the size of Spanish silver dollars. He obtained more land, especially with the help of the Winslow family, so the large extended family of his stepfather. And Edward Winslow soon became the governor of this colony. After his term in office, he was succeeded by his son, Josiah Winslow, who was Peregrine's half-brother. So Peregrine was very closely plugged in to the ruling circles of the Plymouth colony. And we should remember at this point that the Plymouth colony was separate from the Massachusetts Bay colony. So these so-called pilgrim colonists were not Puritans. The Puritans were a party or wing within the Church of England that wanted to purify that church and cleanse it of the vestiges of Catholicism as they saw it. And they created the much larger Massachusetts Bay Colony beginning in 1630. Whereas this earlier and smaller group of so-called pilgrims were not Puritans, they were separatists who had broken away entirely from the Church of England 
and they had a different philosophy in their church. It was not focused on the profession of faith, the way the Puritan churches were. Rather, it was based around strict discipline, and one had to adhere to very strict codes of behavior and discipline in order to be a member of this church. So the Plymouth colony, centered around Plymouth and Marshfield, was smaller, It was governed a bit differently, and it maintained comparatively friendly relations with the indigenous people, specifically the Wampanoag, which were the main indigenous polity in this region in the 1600s. In Marshfield itself, the colonists held land that they could cultivate on the condition that the Native Americans would still be able to travel freely and hunt and fish on that land. So there was a sort of negotiated coexistence in which neither group had complete control over that land. And this arrangement in Marshfield seems to have held fairly well until 1662, when the main Wampanoag leader, Wamsutta, died mysteriously shortly after visiting the home of the governor, Josiah Winslow. And this mysterious death, which may possibly have been a poisoning, cast a pall of suspicion over this relationship between the English colonists and the Wampanoag, and Wamsutta's successor, Metacom, also called King Philip, was for a long time very suspicious and wary of the colonists, which later helped to lead to war between the English colonies and the Wampanoag and their allies. And Josiah Winslow commanded the forces of the Plymouth Colony against the Wampanoag and their Indian Confederates in the devastating and cataclysmic King Philip's War in 1675 to 76. And as a result of this war, indigenous people were driven out and away from Marshfield. And this, of course, only opened up even more opportunities then for colonists like Peregrine White to take more territory and build up larger estates. So by the 1690s, it seems Peregrine White was a very large landholder who was able to prosper, especially from cattle, which were raised abundantly around the area of Marshfield. In 1696, Peregrine White finally officially joined the Marshfield Church at the age of 75. So it might sound surprising, but this is not unusual for colonial New England. Not everyone was simply automatically a member of the church, even after the so-called halfway covenant. One had to profess one's faith or agree to adhere to very strict rules of discipline in order to join a colonial New England church. And only a minority of the people were full official members of the church. So Peregrine joined the church in Marchfield in 1696 and then died only eight years later in 1704 at the age of 83, which was a pretty impressive but not exceptional age. His obituary was published in the Boston Newsletter. This was a fairly newly created newspaper in New England, and Peregrine, it seems, was the only Mayflower passenger of any sort to actually have an obituary printed. This passage in the Boston Newsletter of 1704 reads, quote, Marshfield, July 22nd, Captain Peregrine White of this town, aged 83 years and eight months, died on the 20th. He was vigorous and of a comely aspect to the last, was the son of Mr. William White and Susanna, his wife, born on board the Mayflower, Captain James Commander, in Cape Cod Harbor, November 1620. He was the first Englishman born in New England. Although he was in the former part of his life extravagant, yet was much reformed in his last years, and died hopefully. And that final word, hopefully, in this context means with faith or hope that he would enjoy salvation and eternal life. So this implies a kind of come to Jesus or conversion moment late in Mr. White's life, which again was not unusual, although 75 may have been even a bit older than the norm. Descendants of both the Winslow and White families remained for many generations in Marshfield and became prosperous and well-connected in the politics of the colony, 
and for many years intermarried. And it seems that this cradle, whether or not it did truly come over on the Mayflower, it was passed on within this extended and somewhat incestuous extended Winslow White family through the 1700s. So Marshfield became a particularly wealthy town, dominated by these long-standing families, who in a way became kind of colonial grandees. And when the revolution broke out, Marshfield actually became the most strongly loyalist town in New England. Many of the men, including landholders in Marshfield, joined in the so-called Loyal American Association, which fought alongside the British troops against the revolutionaries. One descendant of Peregrine White named Abijah White was actually severely injured. He was shot in the back at the Battle of Boston Light in 1775. And when the war ended and the British had fully withdrawn from New England, many of the residents, the leading residents of Marshfield, especially Winslow's, were expelled from Massachusetts or fled voluntarily to Loyalist outposts in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. So the Loyalist background of Marshfield, although it wasn't emphasized, it still continued to linger many years after the Revolution and the establishment of the Independent Republic. There were often no July 4th celebrations held at Marshfield, like you would see in basically any other New England town. No book chronicling the history of Marshfield was published until the 20th century. And this cradle, with its connection directly back to the pilgrims, was reportedly passed down mainly in the Winslow family until it was finally given to the Pilgrim Hall Museum in 1877 at which point the revolution had become a fairly distant memory, and the residents both of Marshfield and in Plymouth preferred to emphasize their connection to the founding of Plymouth and to the pilgrim migration, which could come to serve as a kind of alternate story of the founding of America alongside the revolution. If we look at the cradle itself, it's very long and narrow, and it has a back section with a hood over the top. And it seems that this design was significant and advantageous to the pilgrims who apparently owned several cradles like this made in England or the Netherlands. And the shape, the long narrow shape, made it possible to tightly swaddle an infant and hold it straight and the thinking was that doing so would help the child to develop long, straight limbs. So the philosophy at this time was that you could not simply allow a child to move around, roll around, crawl around as he or she wished, but rather you had to control the positioning and movement of an infant's body in order to help shape it into a proper, upright adult. And at this time, there wasn't as much of a concept of a distinct childhood apart from adulthood. Adults and children often were expected to do the same tasks, like tending a garden, and to engage in the same leisure activities. Pilgrim separatists saw it as their duty to kind of create properly behaved miniature adults, almost right from the very beginning crawling was seen as shameful and animalistic. And one of the marks of this is that infants tended to be put in long flowing gowns or smocks. You may have seen images of these, which make it impossible to crawl across the floor. And they were often not only swaddled, but propped up in the back part of a cradle or later, once they were taken out of the cradle, propped up with strings and cloths in chairs or on stools in order to encourage them sitting upright as soon as possible. And this was considered a way to suppress the more animalistic nature of the child, to separate the child from its baseness, its closeness to the ground, and lift it up and shape it into a properly behaved and disciplined adult. <laughs> 
So in a lot of ways, this crib illustrates the philosophy and theology of the separatists, which in many ways was even more strict than that of the Puritans, right, who tended to emphasize the work of grace and of faith in redeeming a person from their sinfulness. Pilgrims saw it more as a duty that they had to actively undertake to shape themselves and their children. It also illustrates the very different nature of the pilgrim migration from everything that had come before in North America. The pilgrim migration was rich with full families, and it was aimed at creating a permanent and self-sustaining colony in the New World. The pilgrims had already exiled themselves voluntarily from England in order to try to create their own church and their own way of life outside of the purview of the Church of England in the Netherlands. And they saw emigration from Europe all the way to America as a way to continue that project of building a separatist society and a separatist church, while at the same time being able to gain land, territory, and make money in a way that they didn't have much opportunity to do in the Netherlands. And if we think back to previous migrations of Europeans into America, they really began with Spanish and Portuguese conquest enterprises, right? Like those of Cortes and Pizarro, for instance, which were made up basically entirely of men, which were aimed at seizing control of existing societies in the New World, and that often led to these men marrying indigenous wives or taking indigenous concubines. Whereas later, we see English colonists, in particularly in Virginia, starting to bring some European women over to the colony in hopes of creating more of a complete and self-sustained society. In 1608, the first two English women went to the Virginia colony. More came later, but it was still very much gender imbalanced. When we look at the pilgrims who came over on the Mayflower, the Mayflower carried a total of 102 passengers, and 50 of these, just less than half, were adult men. Aside from those 50 men, There were 19 women and 31 children and teenagers. And out of those 19 women, three were pregnant. So this is the first time that a colony is being created with European women on board, you might say, right from the beginning. And many entire families, like the whites, and anticipation right from the beginning of children being born. So in a lot of ways, the pilgrim migration was a different kind of project. And the existence of this cradle, whether or not it did actually literally come over on the Mayflower, shows how the whole philosophy and aim of this colony was something new. And it happens that the pilgrims originally intended to settle somewhere in Virginia, which was the general term for basically the whole eastern seaboard of North America that the English claimed as their territory. And they just ended up landing a bit farther north than they had anticipated in this area that earlier explorers like John Smith and Bartholomew Gosnold had already called New England. Although they didn't necessarily know this, this was really a lucky accident for the pilgrims because this more northern area with its colder winters was safer. It was more protected from tropical diseases like malaria, and it would have a kind of quarantining effect where these populations could start to grow in a way that was much more difficult in the more dangerous disease environment of the Chesapeake. And for a long time, these Pilgrim and Puritan settlements were actually able to grow practically unchecked. Migrants came over from Europe, they had many children, they multiplied, and they overtook and overwhelmed the Native American population that was catching so many of these diseases that they had never had before and that Europeans brought over. 
And this situation basically continued until around 1700, when these towns were growing big enough and crowded enough and were more and more closely connected with travel and trade to the Caribbean and the southern colonies. And so diseases like smallpox started to break out in ways they had never done before. And it's completely possible, although I haven't seen any record, that smallpox is actually what finally killed Peregrine White. So in this way, we can see this cradle as an artifact of this specific window in time, when for the first time ever, Europeans were able to reproduce and create a growing self-sustaining population in America, like had never really happened before anywhere else, and like would not happen in the same way afterwards either, when the disease environment changed and more and more the population and the labor force depended on enormous numbers of poor indentured servants from Europe and then African slaves. So thank you so much for listening. And again, this particular lecture will be for patrons only for one year. And soon I should be posting more publicly on other topics including within the next few weeks, I expect to post a special conversation between myself and my friend, the television critic, Sonia Saraya. Thank you.